Okay. The, the Mandela effect. The reason why I chose this uh, subject is because um, it has, it's one of the hottest topics online. And um, I thought, I didn't think much of it at the beginning because I thought it was more like a hoax. So I had to do some research. And I came across this uh, film called the um, uh, interview with a, a vampire, which for me it was always interview with a vampire because I used to go to the video club to choose a video that was back in the 90s and I remember distinctly looking for it, it was an A. And I thought, why is there everywhere a they? It's not the case. So the Mandela effect is a term for where a group of people all misremember the same detail, event of physicality. And it is named after this instance which a large group of people all share the same memory about Nelson Mandela. Um, he died in 2013, but it looks like many people remember his death being back in the 1980s. Now, so because of that, the effect exploded in popularity on the internet when this uh, a peculiar example popped up where a majority of people seem to have recalled another incident, the Bernstein Bears books, as being spelled as Bernstein or some other variation. So what is the origin? Where it all started with this Mandela effect? Well, it started back in 2010 in um, a forum with a blogger called Fiona Broom. She's that lady who started the whole thing. And Broom described an experience at the convention called DragonCon, where she discovered the others had a false memory uh, similar to hers, which is, was the Nelson Mandela had died during his imprisonment back in the 1980s. And she said back then, see, I thought Mandela, Nelson Mandela died in prison. Uh, I thought I remembered it clearly, complete with news clips of his funeral and um, the heartfelt speech by her widow. And then I found out that he was still alive. Fiona recounted discovering many widely held alternative, alternative memories, including those of Star Trek episodes that had never actually existed and the death of the Reverend Billy Graham. So uh, Mrs. Broom is a self-described paranormal uh, consultant and researcher. And I think he's done also, he's wrote also a book. So that's where it started back in 2010 in an online forum. And then it just exploded because it looks like more people were finding out that there's some things that they remember that don't exist anymore in our reality. Now, before we delve into the Mandela effect, there is a couple of things we need to define from the beginning. First of all, what is a false memory? Because many out there, when you do your research, they believe that the Mandela effect is nothing more than a false memory. Um, and they have tried to explain when the phenomenon, the phenomenon this way. A, a false memory is a fabricated or distorted recollection of an event. So people often think of memory as something like a, a video recorder, which is accurately collecting all the data and then stores it away as it happens with accuracy and clarity. But in reality, memory is very prone to fallacy. So people can feel completely confident that their memory is accurate, but this confidence is no guarantee that a particular memory is correct. You see, one of the problems of the human brain is that it doesn't like gaps. So basically, if you're having a memory and there's a part of the memory missing, what the human brain will do, will go and pick up a relevant piece of information and put it in your memory. So say if you remember yourself being in your bedroom, but there is one particular piece of information missing, which is the lampstand sitting right next to your bed. What your brain will do, will go and pick up any lampstand from any other memory, say a TV set, yet you remember. So that's how the brain works. So so many people, 
online, they have tried to explain away the Mandela effect as a false memory. Now, the thing is, there is a problem because false memory is something that you encounter yourself personally. But this is something that affects a large part of the population. Uh, people misremembering mis a detail, but it happens to many people at the same time. And this is why some people are so adamant with their, with their claims about the, the memories. So I don't think it is a false memory, because false memory is just for a person. False memory is not for a large group of people who misremember exactly the same detail at the same time. Now, some others say, well, it can be a cognitive dissonance. Um, cognitive dissonance is this mental stress of discomfort that you experience as an individual when you hold, hold certain, certain beliefs, ideas or values, and then you're confronted with new information that conflicts, conflicts with the existing beliefs, ideas or values. And you don't want to change that mind frame. So that is cognitive dissonance. Now, many Mandela effects are usually trivial details about an oddly specific set of categories. Uh, these include things such as the how and the when of a celebrity death, uh, misspellings, usually replaced or removed letters, placement of uh, geographical locations, quotations within the media, all alternative imagery. Now, I'm going to go through some well-known examples of Mandela Effect. I'm going to miss quite a lot because there's so many examples out there. But I picked up the ones who relate with films because you also get the, uh, the visual effect. Now, the first one, it comes from a film, The Forest Gam, with uh, Tom Hanks. And it's a 1994 uh, American comedy drama. A uh, film based on the 1986 novel of the same name by Winston Groom. Now, this film was directed by Robert Zemeckis and stars Tom Hanks. The story depicts several decades in the life of Forrest Gump, a slow-witted but kind-hearted, good-natured and athletically prodigious man from Alabama, uh, who witnesses and in some cases influences some of the defining events of the American history in the 20th century. Now, there is a scene in that film where everybody remembers it, or whoever watched this film in the past, uh, Tom Hanks saying that my mom always said life is like a box of, ch box of chocolates. But now, whatever you look anywhere online or you buy the film, you will find out that it says was like a box, of, a box of chocolates. So life was like a box of chocolates. So apparently, this is not how millions of cinema goers remember the phrase. Most people remember Tom Hanks says, life is like a box of chocolates. So watch with me this clip, and we'll just make up our minds. Hello. My name's Forrest, Forrest Gump. Do you want a chocolate? I could eat about a million and a half of these. My mom always said life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. So that's what it says today. It was like a box of chocolates. Now, this is how many millions remember this scene, but many people, including myself, remember Tom Hanks saying, Tom is like, uh, box, life is just like a box of chocolates. Now, you may say, well, you don't remember it right until you realize where there is another part in the film that his mother is saying the correct phrase. And that's the one I want to play to you. I happen to believe you make your own destiny. You have to do the best with what God gave you. What's my destiny, Mom? You're gonna have to figure that out for yourself. Life is a box of chocolates for us. You never know what you're gonna get. Mama always had a way of explaining things so I could understand them. 
So you see the discrepancy is solved already in the same film and that creates more questions of course. Now one can make the case that there were probably two takes in the same scene and the one didn't make the cut and the one that Tom Hanks says life was like uh, a box of chocolates was the one that was rejected and maybe Google is messing up with our heads having stored making available only the wrong one so keep this thought in mind because we're going to go to another film now which makes things more complicated and it looks like the Mandela effect becomes more uh, realistic so the next one is interview with a vampire now this interview with a vampire is a 1994 American drama horror film by, uh, directed by Neil Jordan and based on the 1976 novel Interview with a Vampire by Anne Rice starring Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt. Now this film was released back in November 1994 and received positive reviews and also received also two Oscar nominations which is very important for the story for best art direction and best original score. Now most people asked uh, remember vividly, including myself, that the film's title was Interview with a Vampire and not The Vampire. And back in those days, as I said earlier, uh, we still used to hire videos because that's still in the, the time where the videos were still um, out. I think the DVDs came back in 1996. And um, I think I hired the film a couple of times and I vividly remember it being Interview with a Vampire. Now, so is Google messing up with our heads again? Uh, interestingly, this film was nominated for two Oscars, so it, so it happens that we have footage from this year's Oscar nominations. So watch this clip because that makes this film interesting for the Mandela effect. Uh, it's another blockbuster year for Hollywood, uh, the motion picture interview uh, with a vampire. Uh, the motion picture interview uh, with the vampire. Elliot Goldenthal for interview with the vampire. I wanted the interview with the vampire to be a departure. I wanted to, first of all, I always thought the vampire was the interesting one. So, just to uh, hear what you say is not just only the film being interviewed with a vampire, but you have also external uh, evidence from the co most credible evidence that it was the case of an A. Because, of course, when you present the Oscar nominations, the first thing you're going to make sure is that you, s you spell the whole title of the film correctly. And then you have Anne Rice, the writer of the book, who also says it's an A. So, that's quite interesting because it comes from the same time that the film was released but now when you look online you only find interview with the vampire and that things i think make things more interesting and the case for the Mandela effect more probable now another one is the star wars um, which later retitled a star wars episode for a new hope and that was released back in 1977 written by George Lucas and it was the first Star Wars film and today it is often regarded as one of the best films of all time as well as one of the most important films in the history of motion pictures most people remember the famous exchange between Darth Vader and Luke as look I am your father but surprisingly any modern video clip you will find online today is having Darth Vader saying no I am your father so here's the clip from this film. Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. He told me enough. He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. No. I think it doesn't even make sense in the script to put something like no, I am your father. It does make sense. Nevertheless, that's what you find online about this film today. Now, James Earl Jones, who was, uh, who did the voiceover of Darth Vader for that film, he even remembers the phrase as being, look, I am your father. And we even have evidence, clip evidence about him. So 
Here's him talking about, look, I'm your father. When I first saw the dialogue that said, Luke, I am your father, I said to myself, he's lying. I wonder how they're gonna play that liar. Redneck Jedi says, Luke, I am your father and your uncle. <laughs> So the very person who did the voiceover, he's telling you now that he actually said, look, I am your father. Everything today you find is, look, no, I am your father, which it doesn't make sense even in the script. Now, the last example is the one from uh, Snow White, a classic Disney movie which dates all the way back in 1937, which is almost, I think it's about 60 years ago, 80 years ago, oh, sorry. Right, Snow White, the classic Disney film. Everyone remembers the evil queen standing in front of the mirror saying, mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? That's a classic, everybody remembers that. Mirror, mirror is what most people remember the queen saying back in this 1937 Disney movie. Uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Um, one would think that the, the, that memory, memorable movie uh, produced reliable, consistent memories, including the famous Miro Miro line. However, any modern audio or visual references are having the Queen in the movie actually saying, magic mirror on the wall. And here is the clip. Thou know, my Queen. Magic mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest one of all? Famed is thy beauty, Majesty. But hold, a lovely maid I see. Rags cannot hide her gentle grace. Alas, she is more fair than thee. So that's magic mirror on the wall. Nobody remembers it this way. It's mirror, mirror on the wall. Uh, this phrase is etched in people's minds to such a degree for the past 80 years as Miro Miro, that even modern adaptations of this film, of this fairy tale in film, are using the same phrase. Now, most recent example is the film Miro Miro from 2012, starring Julia Roberts. What is Julia Roberts seeing, uh, saying in this modern adaptation? <coughs> well, if the title of the film doesn't give it away. Once upon a time, in an enchanted kingdom, there was a beautiful princess with skin as white as snow and hair as black as night. Blah, blah, blah. Her hair is not black, it's raven, and she's 18 years old, and her skin has never seen the sun, so of course it's good. This spring, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Snow White. What? What? Snow White. Ugh. A classic tale. So. It was mirror, mirror on the wall, but today it's magic mirror on the wall. Now, these are just some of the examples. There are so many other examples and in relation with this Mandela effect, which, of course, you can make the case that it does exist. So I'm just going to um, then follow it up with a couple of explanations of what could possibly be. Why do we see this change? This changes in our reality in relation to names, in relation to films, in relation to even geographical locations in the planet. The first one is that it relates with time, travel and CERN, which is this major scientific experiment in Switzerland. Now, the seemingly minor changes or differences related to the Mandela effect are odd to say the least. So if realities were randomly merging, I think we would expect to see far greater, greater differences and with far more reaching consequences. It makes me think it of a scientific test. Let's go back and change this one minor thing and see A, how it affects the current timeline and B, how people react to these changes. And they are testing how past timeline changes affect the current universe. 
but to what end? Perhaps some major change in the future to see if it is possible and what effects it will have on the general population. Now, the only major nefarious scientific project, as I mentioned, that can be responsible for tests of this kind is CERN. It is the largest scientific project of all times with participating nations which in real life their enemies. And I think that's what makes it nefarious. Why do enemy states come together to contribute towards this project? And also they have in several uh, instances the scientists in that experiment saying that they're trying to reach out different dimensions. So uh, what makes it even more interesting now, uh, CERN posted this video in early 2014, which Mandela Effect was not yet popular, and it's called Happy at CERN. So everybody is seeing, all the signs are seeing, ha dancing around to the tune of Happy. And what's halfway through this video, a scientist is holding two signs. The one reads Mandela and the other one Bond, Bond 1. So this is, this is not a video from a YouTuber, this is official, if you go on CERN's website or I'm not quite sure, their media website, you can find this clip and he clearly holds a sign with the name Mandela. Could it be a coincidence or are they laughing at us, they're making a joke or they're probably responsible for this effect? Now, the, one thing which I would like to touch is this butterfly effect. The butterfly effect is the concept that small causes uh, can affect, have large effects. If a butterfly flaps its wings on one side of the earth, it is said to cause a hurricane on the other. It is a well-known simplistic example of this theory. Initially, it was used for weather prediction, but later the term became a metaphor used in and out of science. So we can only speculate at this point, but from the way that Mandela effects have manifested themselves, we can conclude that they started small, as with the Bernstein bears, and moved on to larger and larger things, uh, like films. So it would seem that someone is testing the butterfly effect. Uh, they choose well-known facts. Uh, and events that have minor effects on the future, and line in a movie, a book title, a restaurant name. Uh, this that people will remember, yet will have no major effects on the timeline universe for the rest of us. They are testing how these changes affect our memories. Notice how many of the things that are changed are years and years old. They are not changing lines from Harry Potter which is very recent because they can't test what effect will have on the population. They are changing details in 30 plus year old media, uh, long enough to justify people misremembering, but short enough that people are still alive to remember. So as we consider this line of thinking of, is it CERN or is, are they testing something to do with the butterfly effect? There's another part which is come straight out of the last book of the Bible and many people even um, in the scientific area, they touch on it. It's the book of Revelation was written about 2000 years ago and it is, it, it warns there uh, that of a time where right before the end of the world man would finally succeed in opening the door to other dimensions with the help of unseen spiritual entities. Now, we read in chapter 9 of the book of Revelation, and I saw a star, which is a reference to an unseen demonic entity, that had fallen from heaven to the earth. And the key to the shaft of the abyss, is it another dimension, was given to him. He opened the shaft of the abyss, and smoke ascended out of the shaft like the smoke of the great furnace. Now, what's the visual adaptation of this part of the book of Revelation? Then the fifth angel.
angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. And they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was two hundred million. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed. By the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents, having heads, and with them they do harm. But the rest of mankind, who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood which could neither see, nor hear, nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, or their sorceries, or their sexual immorality, or their thefts. So, are we on the brink of witnessing the opening of this shaft of the abyss? And is the Mandela effect part of the opening of this other dimension? Now, notice that this 2000 old year prophecy also warns of the dire consequences of achieving this goal. Uh, maybe they partially know that. Uh, that is why, as I mentioned earlier, the Mandela effect feels more like a controlled test that they incrementally increase its impact in order to monitor the effects in our timeline and on us, the unsuspected public. Now, in another part of the Bible, another prophecy relating to our times, the time of the end, was of a final world ruler, the Antichrist, who is able to manipulate time and its effect in our world. Uh, could that possibly also point towards CERN and the Mandela effect? Uh, a verse from the book of Daniel 7.25 says, He, the final world ruler, Antichrist, will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. You see this phrase, to change the set times. Uh, could that be time manipulation, CERN and Mandela effect? So there's no doubt that memory is key in many of these instances. And while the theory of parallel universes, time travel, CERN and others are certainly thought provoking, uh, they are far more likely theories uh, 
that can be backed up with actual medical, psychological research being conducted today in conjunction with documented US government experiments of the past. A famous writer and author, Steve Quayle, back in May 31st, 2016, at the Hagman and Hagman report, which you can find online too on YouTube, said that um, the Mandela effect is deception. It is about uh, false memories, which is an, a non offshoot of uh, mind control MK Ultra experiments, uh, alternate histories and shared memories, um, which are being intentionally broadcast to change our perception of what is real and what is not. And he called it a virtual devil's mental playground. The US military and intelligence agencies are spending vast amounts of money to program the brain and to be able to both read your thoughts and control them and or implant them. So that's Steve Quayle. Now, this is an explanation which will resonate with more people uh, who, want, who are not convinced about the previous theories about the phenomenon. So people who find explanations about CERN or parallel universe or time travelers too far-fetched to follow, maybe they can uh, look into this MK Ultra, a mind control experiments by governments which have been documented for decades. So a couple of things to say about M MK Ultra and how it affects people. It was used back uh, in the days in the 50s and the 60s but from the CIA and it was authorized in 1953 but expanded in 1955 to include the following. Promoting the intoxicating effect of alcohol, rendering the induction of hypnosis easier or otherwise enhance, enhance its usefulness, producing amnesia for events preceding and during the use, and shock and confusion over extended periods of time. They are even used on unsuspected victims LSD and other drugs in a way to control them and uh, declassified documents from the government's mind control project show that the test subjects could be hypnotized uh, hear that by telephone by receiving written matter or by the use of code signal or words uh, control of those hypnotized can be passed from one individual to another without great difficulty it has also been shown by experimentation with victims of mind control that they can act as unwilling couriers of information purposes and that they can be conditioned uh, to a point where they believe a change in identity on their part, even on the polygraph. And this is now back in the 50s, okay? So over 60 years ago. If they could do that 60 years ago, imagine how far advanced they are today in experimenting in larger parts of the population, even in a worldwide scale with our friends Hollywood and the broadcast and the big films. So that comes from uh, documents that they were made available to the public because mind control and behavioral control induced by the US government for over a decade. It wasn't until 1976 and 1977 that the US Senate conducted investigations and even held uh, a joint committee hearing on Project MK Ultra. So, according to the article linked above, meaning information wasn't revealed to the public about the US government's mind control experiments until one or two decades later, after the project was authorized and over a decade after it supposedly was ended. Now, Many believe that CIA's mind control experiments never ended. They just changed their names. And there are still government-funded mind control experiments being conducted in, to this day undercover. Now, this is a clip, the following is a clip, from Bill Clinton offering a public apology to the victims of MKUltra back in the 90s, which proves, and I, was, I even was on the telly when it came out, which proves that technologies of this kind not only exist, but they have been used against us without our consent. This report I received today is a monumental document in more ways than one. 
but it is a very, very important piece of America's history, and it will shape America's future in ways that will make us a more honorable, more successful, and more ethical country. What this committee learned, I would like to review today with a little more detail than Dr. Faden said, because I think it must be engraved on our national memory. Thousands of government-sponsored experiments did take place at hospitals, universities, and military bases around our nation. The goal was to understand the effects of radiation exposure on the human body. While most of the tests were ethical by any standards, some were unethical, not only by today's standards, but by the standards of the time in which they were conducted. They failed both the test of our national values and the test of humanity. Informed consent means your doctor tells you the risk of the treatment you are about to undergo. In too many cases, informed consent was withheld. Americans were kept in the dark about the effects of what was being done to them. The deception extended beyond the test subjects themselves to encompass their families and the American people as a whole. For these experiments were kept secret. And they were shrouded not for a compelling reason of national security, but for the simple fear of embarrassment. And that was wrong. So today, on behalf of another generation of American leaders and another generation of American citizens, the United States of America offers a sincere apology to those of our citizens who were subjected to these experiments, to their families, and to their communities. When the government does wrong, we have a moral responsibility to admit it. The duty we owe to one another to tell the truth and to protect our fellow citizens from excesses like these is one we can never walk away from. Our government failed in that duty and it offers an apology to the survivors and their families and to all the American people who must, who must be able to rely upon the United States to keep its word, to tell the truth, and to do the right thing. Make no mistake, as the committee report says, there are circumstances where compensation is appropriate as a matter of ethics and principle. I am committed to seeing to it that the United States of America lives up to its responsibility. Our greatness is measured not only in how we so frequently do right, but also how we act when we know we've done the wrong thing, how we confront our mistakes, make our apologies, and take action. That's why this morning I signed an executive order instructing every arm and agency of our government that conducts, supports, or regulates research involving human beings to review immediately their procedures in light of the recommendations of this report and the best knowledge and standards available today and to report back to me by Christmas. So, do you think they did that of the goodness of their own heart? Uh, no, they didn't. They were forced to reveal this information and they came out and they apologized. But they, have they stopped the experiments? No, they haven't. They just call them now these days as medical advancements or they have gone underground. So, in our country, in July 2016, which is only a few months ago, eh? the Daily Mail leaked information that shows that scientists are using tricks to plant false experiences in people's brains. That's documented. It has been done in the laboratory. According to the Daily Mail, researchers at Brown University have discovered a way to implant associations in people's brains without their subjects being aware of it happening. Now, in a recent breakthrough, the group used a new technique without the consent, consent of the victims. Uh, on a small group of volunteers, they associate vertical stripes with color red and horizontal stripes with the color green. The people taking part thought they were seeing the color red when looking at black and white stripes and had no idea this was happening. Do that today. If they can do that, then producing something that they like the mental effect is quite possible. Now, this is just a small sample of the research being conducted today, but if you consider that back in 1953, 
The US government successfully managed to hypnotize test subjects via telephone or written matter, by code, signal or words, and that today they are capable of actually removing memories and replacing them with new ones. Well, is it such a big leap in the day and age when the majority of the world uses either the internet or iPads, smartphones and other electronic devices to think that they are perfectly capable of doing to, that to us at any given time. So I think the case I'm trying to make to establish here really is that knowing what we know about MK Ultra and the technology they have possessed for the past 60 years and they still keep secret from the public, is it possible that the internet itself can be used as this devil's virtual mental playground and the so-called Mandela effect could very well be the ultimate mind control experiment. But why? Why would they want to do that? Well, I think a very good answer can be provided as to the why from another project that was revealed back in the 80s, Pro Project Blue Beam. Um, there are several, several secret projects that have been exposed partially the last 20 or 30 years uh, that seem to explain satisfactorily the Mandela effect and its byproducts. So take, for example, this uh, project Blue Beam, a giant show in the sky masterminded by US secret services to make an alien invasion believable to the public and ushering a new age religion for all mankind. And the plan was exposed back in the 19, late 90s by Serge Monest. Now this is not laughing stock. They have attempted that when they tried to invade Cuba, one of the plans, if you go and look it up, one of the valid plans to take over Cuba was to, to project in the sky the image of Jesus and people would call in and all the communication network will go down because of all the phone calls and that was the way to take on Cuba. They didn't put that into effect. But if they tried to do that back in the 60s, well, it's not that far-fetched that they have that in mind for the future. Now, in 1996, Serge Monest, along with another unnamed Canadian journalist, both died from a heart attack after having exposed this plan. And that's why many people believe that it was an assassination. Now, this Project Blue Beam is a NASA Illuminati plan to usher in a New Age religion which will go hand in hand with a New World Order and a One World Leader, the Antichrist. In their research, they had help from intelligence people from the Canadian government, maybe politicians or military personnel who still believed in freedom and they didn't want to go ahead with this Illuminati plan. Now, this Project Blue Beam comes into with four steps. The first one is the introduction of new archaeological evidence that suggests that our history is wrong and we are the product of alien DNA manipulation. The second one is that the major show in the sky that will make most of the mankind believe that an alien invasion is imminent. But the third one is the most interesting. Uh, it connects with the Mandela effect because they said that they were planning to use telepathic electronic two-way communication with low frequency waves that will reach the people of the earth through the insides of their brains making each person believe that his own God is speaking to him from within his soul. Now, if that didn't make sense back in the 80s, maybe, maybe it makes a little bit more sense today if this Mandela effect is indeed real. So, such rays from satellite, remember they, they can use satellite technology, are fed from the memory of computers that store much data about the human being and his languages. And these rays will then interface and interweave with the natural thinking processes to form what we call the artificial talk. Some form of technology that we're not aware of is probably a secret project, but it might as well be used in the future for our control. In few words, the New World Order will be we want wants to control your brain. And there is a reason why they want to do that, because there will be a revolution against it. So if they can't control you personally, they will try to control your brain. 
Now, in order for the new world order to succeed without any opposition to the powers to be known that they need to have full control over you, including your brain, that's why one of the most one of the most expensive projects today, currently financed by the US government, is the Brain Initiative. And what they say is brain research through advancing innovative neurotechnologies. And basically what they want to do is they want to map the human brain because of course they want to control it. And it, is, it starts there, the, the battle for your brain. Now, if you don't believe that, what Mr. Obama explaining away what the brain initiative is and think in the back of your head, what happens if they gain control over this project? You know, as humans, we can identify galaxies light years away. We can study particles smaller than an atom, but we still haven't unlocked the mystery of the three pounds of matter that sits between our ears. But today, scientists possess the capability to study individual neurons and figure out the main functions of certain areas of the brain. But a human brain contains almost 100 billion neurons, making trillions of connections. So as a result, we're still unable to cure diseases like Alzheimer's or autism or fully reverse the effects of a stroke. And the most powerful computer in the world isn't nearly as intuitive as the one we're born with. So there, there's this enormous mystery uh, waiting to be unlocked. And the Brain Initiative will change that by giving scientists the tools they need to get a dynamic picture of the brain in action and better understand how we think and how we learn and how we remember. And that knowledge could be, will be, transformative. So, instead of solving the problems of the world like poverty or human inequality, the most important projects for them is things like CERN or mapping of the brain. And, and just think of how that can play out for a new world order and how they can actually control you. So, as I, I come to the end of this presentation, do I believe that the Mandela effect is real? Yes, I do. And I think it's just the beginning of more things to come with which have to do with the fact that they want to control your reality what you perceive to be real and how they want to manipulate it in a way to manipulate you thank you